I guess. Okay, so hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and for someone very late at night, thank you for coming. And um, welcome to the workshop of Wittgenstein's philosophy in times of crisis. And my name is Wei Zeng, and I'm, I'll be moderating today's session. So before we start, I would like to ask you to keep yourself muted during the whole session. But you can turn on your camera if you would like to. And this online workshop aims to bring together Wittgenstein scholars all over the world to reflect the current global crisis we're facing from different perspectives of Wittgenstein's philosophy. It is organized by an international team of researchers from Japan, China, and Germany. So you can find us as co-hosts like Danka and David and Hai Chang and Saudi who could, cannot be here today and myself. And, and today's session will consist a talk uh, around 45 minutes or one hour, something like that, and followed by a 15 minutes comment and the whole set and then a general discussion. And the whole session will last for around about two hours. So for the discussion, it will be helpful if you can write down your questions and comments first at chat. And, and now I'm very glad to introduce our speaker today, Professor Naomi Sheman. Pro professor Naomi Sheman is an Emerita Professor of Philosophy and of Gender, Women, Sexuality Studies at the Univers University of Minnesota. She is one of the first academics to read Wittgenstein in the feminist light and also one of the first academics to bring Wittgenstein's idea to feminism. Much of her work has centered around um, implications of the interactions between ontology and epistemology. Her publications include Engenderings, Construction of Knowledge, Authority, and Privilege in 1993, Is Academic Feminism That in in 2000, Feminist Interpretations of Wittgenstein in 2002, and Shifting Grounds, Knowledge and Reality, Transgression and Trust in 2011. And also, we're happy to have uh, Zhao Fan to give his comments to Professor Shemin's talk. And Zhao Fan is currently a PhD student at University of Canterbury in New Zealand. His research interests include Alan Turing, Wittgenstein, philosophy of logic and computation, and also history of analytic philosophy. So now, please join me to welcome Professor Sheman to give her talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really delighted to be here and seeing um, a whole bunch of old friends and some uh, newer people I'm just getting to know, and I'm really looking forward to this. And uh, so, what I'm going to be doing is reading my paper, and I'm, I don't have PowerPoint slides, but I'm putting up a share screen, and uh, so you can follow along with me. Uh, does, do you have, is it the paper there? Can you all see it? Okay, good. Um, okay, so this um, is a paper that's in progress. I was asked by the Nordic Wittgenstein Review to write something. And I've been having an incredibly hard time and I can't exactly say why. Um, so this is some version of I'm struggling with that paper. And it has to do with um, sort of philosophizing in interesting, difficult times. Um, I don't say anything about the COVID crisis, so I'd be happy to talk about that if, if in the discussion, if people want to bring that up. Um, and uh, one thing that I do want to say uh, is the, the note here that I was struck um, thinking about uh, reading this paper to, to you all, that how very, very US centric and slightly more broadly Eurocentric it is, even as I'm being critical of what I call Euro modernity, that criticism is largely being voiced from within and from the perspective of somebody, me, living in the US. And um, it's, that's to some extent 
something I should try to to not do so much, but I'm you know at this point I'm not quite sure how to do that. But but I'm very very interested in how, as I say in the note, the issues I discuss look from various elsewheres, and you all are from lots of different elsewheres. Um, so that's partly, I mean, in a sense, something of of an apology, certainly something of a, a limitation. And I was uh, very very aware as I was reading it over. Um, thinking about that. So um, I'll just jump into it and I'll just be scrolling down so um, this somehow let me know if there's any problem with with how this is working. Um, the, uh, the epigraph at the beginning is from Jennifer Finney Boylan who is a, a trans woman um, theorist and uh, writer and uh, something that she wrote really resonated with me, which is, I will set out on this journey, although I do not know the way. So the introduction, uh, this is from uh, Cavell, uh, Availability of Dickens Translated Philosophy, and must we mean what we say. The reason why methods which make us look at what we say and bring the forms of language, hence our forms of life to consciousness, can present themselves to one person as confining and to another as liberating. The reason is, I think, understandable in this way. Recognizing what we say in the way that is relevant to philosophizing is like recognizing our present commitments and their implications. To one person, a sense of freedom will demand an escape from them. To another, it will require their more total acceptance. Is it obvious that one of these positions must, in a given case, be right? I take it that's a rhetorical question, the answer to which is no. Um, it is not obvious that one must be right. There is something odd about, this is me, there's something odd about being a Wittgensteinian philosopher. The Tractatus explicitly claims to have completed the only task to which philosophy can properly lay claim, while the investigations chastens the very framing of problems philosophers might attempt to solve. Since such attempts on the part of non-Wittgensteinian philosophers continue to prolif proliferate and the old ones continue to seduce, there is, of course, a continuing call for the critical, as it's been called, therapeutic project. But is there any other way a Wittgensteinian philosopher might go on? Any way of proceeding that, while it might not immediately be seen as continuing in the same way, might both be true to the spirit of Wittgenstein's later work and also contribute positively to thinking about, if not solving, problems that at least appear on their face to confront us with ordinary urgency. Um, oh, by the way, I was um, doing a Zoom call in my sister's house and she told me to stop shouting. And I realized that I was talking very loudly. So I'm trying mostly to save my voice, not to talk so loudly. If I'm not talking loudly enough, please somebody somehow let me know. Um, I want to suggest an affirmative answer to this question, that is, that there's some way of proceeding as a Wittgensteinian philosopher addressing the what I call ordinary questions. Um, an affirmative answer is specifically one borne out by work that brings a recognizably and sometimes explicitly Wittgensteinian approach to problems that emerge out of the experiences and struggles of Euro-modernity's others. Those who have been excluded from the generic, purportedly universal we that is the properly disciplined subject of the philosophical problems Wittgenstein problematizes. While the problematic nature of philosophical problems is central to the investigations, Wittgenstein's alienation from Euro-modernity emerges mostly in posthumously published writings such as Culture and Value. Bringing the two themes together can, I want to argue, point toward a diagnosis for philosophical dis-ease and a possible cure, the one that Wittgenstein himself was unprepared to take up. As he remarked, and this is in the Remarks on the Foundations of Mathematics, the sickness of a time is cured by an alteration in the mode of life of human beings and the sickness of philosophical problems could be cured only through a changed mode of thought and of life, not through a medicine invented by an individual. 
Now, what I want to suggest is that we historicize the illness of which philosophical problems are the symptoms, seeing them as the residue of the construction of a very particular form of subjectivity, that of the privileged, privileged as generic modern European man, and of course I do mean man, and then look to the forms of life emerging among those who do not in such terms make sense, who in situations more contentious than say counting by twos, do not find themselves among those who do what we do. While philosophers engaged in or sympathetic to such struggles might be tempted to solve the problems inherent in making new sense, we ought, I would argue, to learn from Wittgenstein to chasten those impulses, though not by retreating to quietism. Rather, we do have a positive role to play, we Wittgensteinian philosophers, in articulating what is going on when, in embodied social, political practice, people actively struggle to make new sense and crucially, in engaging in public discussions around such struggles, especially when resistance to them takes forms we are well positioned to diagnose and combat. Now, I come to this project from a place outside of, or at best on the margins of the world of Wittgenstein studies. But my hope is that the explicitly political lens through which I'm viewing Wittgenstein will seem useful both to understanding his challenges to disciplined, especially analytic philosophy, as well as to suggesting a possible way of going on as a Wittgensteinian philosopher in the world we're living in. So while in a certain sense, I'm failing to do what we do, that is failing to go on in the same way in reading and absorbing Wittgenstein's work, my hope is that what I am doing can be taken as an intelligible way of going on. Most ambitiously, my hope is that this way of seeing Wittgenstein, this attitude toward his work, this way of going on with it, will help to make him both more challenging to present day analytic philosophy, as well as more useful for philosophical interventions into matters of social and political concern. So section one. As the idealization of the generic subject, the properly disciplined philosopher occupies a location I've referred to as intelligibility central. That is, making sense just means making sense to me. Thus, non-philosophers need to be warned that when properly disciplined philosophers say, I don't understand, they're not making an autobiographical claim. Rather, it's a supposedly more polite way of saying, you are not making sense. Since if you were making sense, the properly disciplined philosopher would of course understand you. This accusation of failing to make sense can seem like what Wittgenstein, both early and late, accused philosophers of that is using words supposedly to say something, but instead speaking disguised nonsense, not managing to make an actual claim. But there's a crucial difference, especially with what Wittgenstein had in mind in his later work, where the problem with what the philosopher says is its failure to play a role in any actual or even richly imagined practice. As he said, a wheel that can be turned though nothing else moves with it is not part of the mechanism. As I'll discuss below, particularly problematic accusations of failing to make sense do not take this form. Rather, the statements against which the accusations are directed for example, trans women's claims to being women, are very much part of a mechanism and are being opposed precisely for that reason. The demand that the, those statements need to meet the accuser's standards of sense-making is aimed precisely at gumming up the mechanism of social change that such statements actually help to put in motion. We need to understand making sense literally Sense is something we collectively make, and it takes resources and collaboration to make it.
efforts to craft those resources and bring together those collaborations can be stymied when sense is recognized only in the sedimented practices of the dominant social order and when accusations of a failure to make sense are taken to be a reason for bringing those efforts to a halt. Related to taking on the role of intelligibility central is what Cora Diamond refers to as the laying down of requirements. Properly disciplined philosophers are much given to gatekeeping, imposing tests, for example, to determine which sorts of purported entities actually, strictly speaking, as they say, speaking strictly, exist. Historicizing this impulse connects it to the disciplining that grounds privileged as generic Euro-modern subjectivity. Drawing on Stanley Cavell's discussion of Othello in relation to skepticism, I have previously argued that such subjectivity rests on replacing the vulnerability of acknowledging and being acknowledged both by other people as well as by the rest of what gets called the external world with the relative invulnerability of the knowing subject vis-a-vis -vis objects of knowledge. What I want to sketch in the remainder of this paper following but diverging from Cavell is a shift in attitude from such a knowledge first approach to an approach that starts with acknowledgement. A shift that displaces the subject from the role of intelligibility central and places them as always already vulnerably entangled with a world of others, both acknowledging those others and in need of acknowledgement by them. Second section. Uh, this is a quote from Talia Mae Betcher, who's a uh, trans philosopher, um, does what to my mind is the most philosophically rich and interesting um, philosophical work from a trans perspective. And um, uh, this is from a paper that's in fact called What is Trans Philosophy? The key thing is, and this is Talia May Betcher, the key thing is that for what I'll call ground bound philosophy, perplexity isn't philosophical because it is exposed through philosophical critique but rather because it cries out for philosophical illumination. So she's philosophizing starting from a position in which making sense is a challenge and a difficult thing needing to be accomplished. And this is Wittgenstein. One human being can be a complete enigma to another. One learns this when one comes into a strange country with entirely strange traditions. And what is more, even though one has mastered the country's language, one does not understand the people. And not because of not knowing what they're saying to themselves, we can't find our feet with them. And uh, there's a note that the, uh, uh, the German, wir können uns nicht sie finden, is literally, we cannot find ourselves in them. Uh, now, trans women and men, as well as people who are non-binary, um, that is, uh, don't identify as either men or women, or variously genderqueer, frequently meet with resistance from those who refuse to acknowledge their gender identity or profess to be unable to understand it. One locus of this resistance is from self-described gender-critical feminists. Um, some of you may have um, a um, noted the term TERF, T-E-R-F, trans exclusionary radical feminists, which is often used to describe these people. They don't themselves like this term. They choose gender critical feminists, which many of the rest of us don't like because it sort of presumes that we are not, we others, trans allies and trans people are not gender critical, which is ridiculous. Anyway, so it's, the terminology is difficult here. But anyway, one of the, um, these philosophers say, there are philosophers among those contesting the identity claims of trans women. And such contestations frequently include challenges to the intelligibility of those claims. It is sometimes argued that trans women and their allies owe us what they have failed to provide, namely, as it's sometimes put, a coherent metaphysics of gender. So the philosophical demand on what they have to do in order for us to regard them as intelligible. 
numerous trans philosophers and their allies have attempted to comply with the demand for a coherent metaphysics of gender that makes sense of trans experiences and identities. There is much to be learned from this work, not least from the differences among approaches and accounts. But I want to suggest that rather than acceding to the demand for clarity and coherence, we would do better to resist it, taking seriously the making of sense and the conditions that throw that making into disarray. I would suggest that is that we resist the impulse to take on, however respectfully, the role of intelligibility central in order to act in solidarity with those who have been written out of sense by other more traditionally dominant actors. Now, such resistance is in line with the crit critique made by Maria Lugones, and I have this note I added. Uh, she died within the last month or so. Uh, she's a Latina lesbian philosopher from Argentina, spent her career mostly in the US, was an activist and a philosopher, um, extraordinarily um, exciting and important work, and has deeply influenced me. Um, and uh, she, including, she has influenced the way that I read Wittgenstein, though she never explicitly discusses him. Um, she's, I and, and many, many other people miss her terribly, uh, but she's all over my work. Um, so this resistance is in line with the critique Lagones had of white feminist theorists who responded to feminists of color, um, who accused them of ethnocentrism by revising their, that is the white feminist theorists revised their own theories around what got called the problem of difference. What Lugones, what Lugones pointed out was that this response to think that what was called for was better theories missed the point. The problem wasn't in the first instance with the theories, but with what the theorists were doing or failing to do. And what was needed wasn't better theories, but respectful engagement, what she calls interactive acknowledgement, which includes acknowledging that who the more privileged, in this case, white feminist theorists are, is in part who they are perceived to be in the eyes of others, in this case, women of color. As applied to the stance of the well-disciplined philosopher, the message is to turn attention away from providing a theory fix, however genuinely and thoughtfully responsive to the needs of those who have been harmed by the dominant world of sense, and toward the sort of open-ended, ongoing engagement that helps us all live with disorientation and discomfort as new worlds of sense take shape. It involves, this is Wittgenstein, turning our whole inquiry around, but on the pivot of our real need. And while recognizing, as it's not clear Wittgenstein actually did, that real needs may well differ, and for any of us, be difficult to discern. In a rich body of work addressing issues of gender from a trans perspective, Talia May Betcher has been puzzling over questions such as these. Inspired, as I've been, by the work of Maria Lugones, Betcher urges us to think of different worlds. And uh, this is Lugones always puts worlds when she uses it this way in shutter quotes. That is that there is a sense in which we're all living in the same world, the one in which we needed to take account of time differences in order to schedule this, but there is a sense in which we live in different, quote unquote, worlds of sense. Different ways of constructing, in, diff uh, in different worlds of sense, different ways of constructing, in this example, what it is to be a woman. In a trans-friendly world, people have first-person authority over their gender identity. Authority, she betcher, explicates in explicitly ethical terms. It's not that I am in a better position to know, but rather that I have the right to say. Implicit in that account of ethical first person authority is the importance of the second rather than third person stance. The stance one takes toward an interlocutor, not toward an object of knowledge. At the heart of what matters is that I acknowledge you as I need you to acknowledge me, a situation of mutual vulnerability and entanglement 
that is avoided by my turning it, however sympathetically, into a question what I can or cannot know about him or her, or of what precisely his or her claims mean, or what makes them true or false. The question is not what our words mean, but rather, and I want to say, as part of actually understanding what our words mean, what's important is what we are doing, even if unwittingly in using those words. Now, shifting from knowledge to acknowledgement means shifting from a focus on one's theories, one's efforts to understand, to a focus on engagement and recognition, even or especially of those whom we find enigmatic, those in whom, as Wittgenstein puts it, we cannot find ourselves. That is, knowledge-based intelligibility means not just intelligibility to me, but intelligibility in my terms as being relevantly, and I set the terms of relevance, like me. Even as I generously broaden the terms of likeness to include those I take to be wrongfully excluded, I am still holding on to definitional authority, the right to say what we mean. It is, of course, central to Cavell's conception of philosophy that we do this, that we speak for others. But he notes in his discussion of the passage in the epigraph to this section that in speaking for others, we need to attend to what is involved in speaking to them, speaking with them, which I take it involves acknowledging them as part of the conversation, whether or not we can understand what they are saying. <coughs> Understanding may come, there are no guarantees, as we find ourselves in their world. Um, Marie Lugones writes about what she calls world travel. Learning both who we, who we are in their eyes, what they make of us, as well as what we may make of ourselves in relation to them. And in so do doing, we can learn what they make of themselves. Third section, uh, Wittgenstein again, a philosophical problem has the form, I don't know my way about. And this is uh, Rilke. Be patient toward all that is solved, unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves like locked rooms and like books that are now written in a very foreign tongue. Do not now seek the answers which cannot be given you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. And this is uh, Lugones um, on uh, what she calls complex communication, which is what's involved in um, communicating in um, coalitions with people who are variously different from you but you're trying to work together. Complex communication thrives on recognition of opacity and on reading opacity, not through assimilating the texts of others to our own, Rather, it is enacted through a change in one's own vocabulary, one's sense of self, one's ways of living, in the extension of one's collective memory through developing forms of communication that signal disruption of the reduction attempted by the oppressor. Complex communication is creative. In complex communication, we create and cement relational identities, meanings that did not precede the encounter, ways of life that transcend nationalism, root identities, and other simplifications of our imaginations. And this is from Avner Baz. Um, one of the most important lessons I have learned from Cavell is that the pursuit of philosophical theories that leave me out, both in the sense that their sense is not supposed to implicate me, and in the sense that I am not expected to be able to recognize myself and my experience in their portrayal of us. Um, such theories would lead me nowhere or anywhere, anyway, nowhere I wish to go. Nice me again. Sometimes we don't know our way about because we are headed out into uncharted territory or because we have found the old maps and routes to be destructive of our own souls or the souls of those we care about or because the landscape is changing. 
In such cases, it ought not to be the job of the philosopher to clarify our conceptual tools or to make sense of the chaos. Our task is not to simplify, but rather to help to better understand the complexities, to help us to, in Rilke's terms, live our way into the answers. What is called for is coalitional politics, a necessarily uncomfortable undertaking. Even if we can identify who it is that we need to be in coalition with, that is, who is being harmed by the structures that are harming us, even if they might initially seem like the enemy, it can still turn out that our strategies of resistance and theirs are serving to undermine the ground under each other's feet. Our survival rests not on accommodation with structures of power and privilege, but rather on the difficult work of coalition building that begins with acknowledging the ways in which we mutually disorient each other and learning to live in, with, and through that disorientation. Now, Abner Baz, in his discussion of Stanley Cavell's rejection of Saul Kripke's misguided and tone-deaf reconstruction of Wittgenstein, takes seriously, as he, Baz, argues that Cavell does, the term they used is the fragility of our mutual attunement. That is, nothing guarantees that our interlocutor will go on in the same way, will share the orientations, inclinations, and responses that ground shared meaning. Cavell's abiding concern with skepticism, which he refuses to read Wittgenstein as allaying, flows from an awareness of this fragility and of the circumstances that heighten its salience in our lives that expose the instability of the ground under our feet but also in our flight from recognizing our responsibility for maintaining that ground, for going on with the forms of life that are the background for the meanings of our words. Such recognition is, as Baz stresses, ethical, something that calls to us in relation to the others we include when we say we. But neither Cavell nor Boz explores the specific practical dilemmas that actually face people for whom failure to make sense is a feature of ordinary life. And thus they miss the philosophical insights that emerge from engagement between those struggling for intelligibility and those who are more hermeneutically privileged. Such engagement and the articulation of those insights are among the most philosophically distinctive and practically useful tasks for the philosopher after Wittgenstein. Now, philosophers are much given to placing philosophy in relation to other disciplines, typically either above, synthesizing, setting standards or conditions of possibility, abstracting or generalizing, or below, clarifying, humbly tidying or ground clearing, but sometimes alongside. Now, I'm drawn to alongsideness, mostly because the above and below pictures strike me as each in their own way problematically arrogant, too intent on laying down requirements or disciplining. They're different ways of taking up the mantle of intelligibility central. But there are different ways of understanding what it means to be alongside. One way that has a certain currency these days is to see philosophy as engaged in much the same sort of explanatory project as the sciences, where part of what is characteristic of these modes of inquiry is that they penetrate beneath surface appearances to get at what is really going on, and what they reveal may well be a shock to common sense. There may, for example, strictly speaking, not actually be any tables, just microparticles arranged table-wise. Such a shock, we're told, provides no more reason for rejecting what the philosopher argues for than it does for rejecting what the scientist discovers. Why, one of these philosophers, Ted Sider, asks, should the inherited prejudices of our forebears count for anything? They shouldn't, he thinks. But there's an important difference between philosophy and the sciences. For most of us, most of the time, actually nearly all of us, nearly all the time, responsibly forming beliefs about scientific matters rests on judgments about which experts to trust. 
Those judgments can be relatively non-contentious or disputed, but in neither case are most of us in a position to ascertain the truth of the matter for ourselves. It is neither lazy nor in any other way doxastically irresponsible to rely on what others say without fully checking out their evidence and arguments. Certainly, especially in the case of contested claims, we can and should do a certain amount of vetting, but there's no getting beyond our needing at some point to accept the claims of experts, even if we can and should make thoughtful judgments about just which experts we should trust. I don't think that even the most scientifically minded philosophers would urge us to approach philosophical arguments in that spirit. While they might suggest, they do suggest, that there is no reason for most people to have any beliefs at all when it comes to such matters as fundamental ontology, that is, whether there are really tables or just strictly speaking microparticles arranged table-wise, whether they, most people, they say, don't and shouldn't, and there's no reason for them to have any beliefs at all about this. It's surely the case that anyone who does hold such beliefs ought to do so not because someone else no matter how brilliant or eminent has said so, but because they have themselves been convinced by working through the arguments. A requirement that simply does not hold in the case of science, or for that matter history, which even for the most expert of historians is ineliminably dependent on what others have reported. You can't go back and observe for yourself what happened in you know, 1472. Um, now, my own sense of philosophies being alongside other disciplines is better captured through the notion of fellow travelers. We're all trying to figure out the world and our places in it, our relationships to each other and to other things, and we go about this in a wide range of different ways. Philosophizing is a distinctive sort of activity, and part of what distinguishes it is its reliance on persuasion, on its taking seriously those who encounter it, being vulnerable to their, excuse me, rejection or incomprehension and committed to respectful engagement. One way of understanding this distinctiveness is through an image that frequently appears in both Wittgenstein and Cavell, that of creating paths with fellow travelers. Wittgenstein describes the philosophical investigations in the preface as, quote, a number of sketches of landscapes which were made in the course of these long and meandering journeys. Philosophical writing is both a record of such a journey and an invitation to the reader to walk alongside. If as a reader you don't follow the argument, you ought not to share the conclusion. You need to have reached it in the company, perhaps under the guidance of the author, not been teleported to it by the power of their expertise. Um, I'm now gonna be talking a fair amount about paths and I have to acknowledge a debt here to um, Fang Xiao, who uh, I'll refer to um, what it is that he told me when I was, I, was, I gave a series of lectures on Wittgenstein Contemporary World in Beijing in 2015 and he was my companion for one wonderful afternoon and uh, really set me on this path of being obsessed with paths. And I'm very, very grateful to him for that and really pleased that he's going to be my commentator this, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, this whenever it is. The paths Wittgenstein takes us on are meant to lead us back to our ordinary lives, to the homes that give meaning to our words, to the rough ground we have fled in search of something pure or more absolute. But there are people for whom the rough ground of common sense, of what all competent users of the language can be presumed to know, that that ground, instead of providing the roughness of that ground, instead of providing traction that makes walking possible, is rather strewn with roadblocks, trenches, and landmines. Such awareness could lead to a desire to escape, to tether one's hopes to a skyhook of ultimate vindication to give up on trying to make sense here and now. But instead, as Betcher urges and exemplifies, it can lead to setting out on a path with fellow travelers, to creating and inhabiting new worlds of sense, new forms of life. One might respond that the sorts of agreements that Wittgenstein is relying on, like counting by twos, are not in this way tendentious or exclusionary. 
and do provide sufficiently, sufficient, genuinely shared ground for us all as human to be mutually intelligible. Now there is something to this response, but it fails to capture the lived experience of people who do find themselves in ordinary everyday settings and interactions, failing to make sense to those around them or else making terrible deadly sense. As Betcher says about being trans, they want to kill us. And it fails to capture what for Boz and Cavell is central to Wittgensteinian skepticism, namely the fragility of our mutual attunement. What can we learn from attention to and acknowledgement of those for whom that fragility is not a universal and for the privileged among us an abstractly theoretical possibility, even if confronting that possibility leads to genuine fear? but those rather for whom part of the texture of their everyday lives forming the rough ground under their feet. I started thinking more specifically about paths as the result of a conversation I had in 2015 with Fan Zhao, who was then a graduate student at Beijing Normal University, where I was giving a series of lectures on Wittgenstein in the present day world. Fan Zhao told me about a frequently cited quote from the early 20th century left-wing writer Lu Zhen. The quote is, hope cannot be said to exist, nor can it be said not to exist. It is just like paths across the earth, where actually the earth had no paths to begin with, but when many people pass one way, a path is made. Lu Zhen was making a point about hope and paths were a useful way of making that point. It is presumably obvious that there are no paths prior to their being trodden, but they're no less real for that. And those who would lament pathlessness ought rather to start walking. But Fan Zhou told me this story, not to make a point about hope, but to note that the point about paths is interesting in its own right, as I have very much found it to be. Learning for it, for example, about what gender is from those for whom what we do makes their lives unintelligible, has to begin with, it cannot be a precondition for acknowledgement, responsive and responsible mutual engagement. And one way that engagement proceeds is by learning to speak differently. For example, using pronouns that might initially seem strange or awkward or ungrammatical, uh, in English at the moment, that means using uh, they as a singular pronoun, either um, for someone whose gender is not known, for someone who is genderqueer, or sometimes just, um, you know, in general, not marking gender by using he or she. Um, and people resist this. They say it's awkward, ungrammatical. Um, as Wittgenstein and following him, Cavell, have shown, learning a language is an initiation into a form of life. One learns what matters and how, how things are connected, what is similar to what and why, and how some similarities matter, what's important to notice, what is and is not funny. Um, the important point about so-called politically correct language around race, sexuality, gender, etc., is not to just take up whatever rules relevant groups formulate, but rather to see word choices as ways of being initiated into a new form of life, learning one's way around that world, learning that will initially feel formulaic, rote, and awkward, but that, if all goes well, will help one over time to become a, interesting word, naturalized citizen of that world. Finding one's feet, not feel, feet, on ground rough enough for friction, but affording passage for fellow travelers forging paths. The forms of life that spring up along new paths are of course not hermetically sealed. And they're not hermetically sealed in part because those paths are not on the moon or in another galaxy. They're here on this shared planet and they alter everyone's landscape. Marriage, for example, despite the reassurances of many campaigners for same-sex marriage, will be changed for everyone when it ceases to be a deeply gendered affair. And similarly, gender will not be for anyone as it was 
before variously transgendered people become visible and audible. Now, the secrecy that was a condition of access to gender confirming medical interventions was clearly designed precisely to minimize the disruption to normatively gendered forms of life. That didn't work. That the new paths crisscross old landscapes reflects how much we all do all share. But the presence of new paths highlights the contingency, the fragility of even what remains most settled even as we rely on its holding beneath our feet. Critiques of foundationalism have too often been captured by a post-structuralist, post-modern rejection of any talk of ground or groundedness or relatedly of truth or reality. By contrast, Wittgensteinian anti-foundationalism is actually far more radical in resisting the foundationalist insistence on the necessity of bedrock to meaningfully ground our practices. Instead, the Kinshinian anti-foundationalism, drawing our attention to the actual literal and metaphorical ground under our literal and metaphorical feet. Back to the rough ground is a radically anti-foundationalist slogan. The roughness of the ground is on the surface. It is where we move and live and we are responsible for its contours. And when we forge paths across that surface, we change the physiognomy of the earth. In a discussion of black feminist science fiction author, Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower, the Reverend Mariama White Hammond referred to Harriet Tubman's leading enslaved people to freedom along the Underground Railway. I don't know where I'm going but I have to head out, start walking and sing. In particular, in the case of the Underground Railroad um, and um, uh, enslaved people being read to freedom, in particular sing um, a spiritual song called Follow the Drinking Gourd, which is a reference to the constellation the Big Dipper, whose star's alignments point toward Polaris, the North Star which is however not a destination, it's hope. Actual movement toward freedom relied on the Underground Railroad, on the ground connections forged by chains of trust. As we learn to find our feet with initially inscrutable others, creating coalitions through complex communication, starting not with knowledge, but with acknowledgement, we as fellow travelers are creating paths toward destinations that will become clear only as we approach them, as we move together away from the forms of life that harm us. Thank you. Thank you so much for Professor uh, Sheman. And now, could I invite uh, Fan Zhao to give you a comment? Um, okay. Um... So um, thank you, Professor Sh uh, Shaman, for this very um, inspiring talk. Um, and thank you for the um, organizers for inviting me as a commentator. So um, I'm really glad to see um, that our conversation that um, Professor Shaman and I had in 2015, um, I think it happened in the afternoon, can develop some really thoughtful ideas and I could even have the opportunity to comment and um, reflect on this matter. Um, so I agree um, with most of what you said actually uh, in the talk as well as in the paper. So I just want to raise um, three comments or questions um, that hopefully can help me and the audience um, better understand uh, your uh, project. So, um, so firstly, um, I'd like to begin um, with a comment on the idea of a path. Um, in the paper, uh, which you don't actually um, uh, read in, in, in this talk, is the translation issue about um, to, tra to use path rather than road to translate uh, Lucian's code. Um, and I agree with that because um, it really emphasizes the strong connection between path and action. Um, 
So we can know what a road looks like by referring to a map, but we can never know what a path looks like or where it leads to, or even the existence of a path, unless we walk and find out by ourselves. So I think you really made some interesting um, observations about path, ground, learning, and some other concepts. So I just want to um, add one point, uh, if it has not yet been covered or covered explicitly uh, in the talk. So I think the um, very existence of a path uh, reveals the commonality uh, um, rather than just the difference of the forms of life that we shared. So surely there are differences, otherwise we won't have many, many different paths. But a path is different from footprints. So I want to make a difference between a path and a footprint or a series of footprints. So I may have a walk in the park, but the result is some footprint, so not a path yet. So there may be countless footprints on the ground, but to be a path, we need to walk on and continue to walk on the same pattern. Um, although not, not necessarily, I mean the same, um, the same, um, the, the same step. So sometimes um, this will be a consciousness um, decision that we decide to follow on the track. But sometimes it is just an unconsciousness walking, especially when the track of the path is not very clear initially. So, so it is the, the, the path that emphasizes the commonality, but the footprints on the path that emphasize the difference that we have. So I think it would be nice if you uh, could shine some light on um, path, footprint, uh, road, uh, if there's uh, anything could be said about that. So, um, so secondly, um, I actually have a question about the extent and limit of your project. So you describe the goal of this project as finding a way that a Wittgensteinian philosopher might go on. So that is, as you said um, um, in the talk, a way of proceeding that might both be true to the spirit of Wittgenstein's later work and also contribute positively to thinking about problems with ordinary urgency. And then you move on to uh, a reflection on the gender problem that we might face uh, in everyday life. So I will move on uh, to this practical domain in the next point. But for now, I'm curious about um, whether this project uh, can go on or extend in the theoretical domain. So in particular, I'm curious about whether it would be possible that there is something positive a Wittgensteinian philosopher can do with the current scientific development. So such like in the neuroscience, um, because I think many Wittgensteinian philosophers are um, not only interested in um, the um, philosophy of gender, but also uh, interested in more broadly, um, a philosopher of science and so on. And, and uh, But at this point, it's very interesting because we know that Wittgenstein's philosophy of psychology, his later philosophy, um, is often been reading as a very hostile to the current development in neuroscience. So we can, we can see that from, um, for example, Peter Hacker and Max Bennett's book, philosophical foundations of neuroscience. So in their interpretation, so philosopher, philosophy is below science. So it's in the sense of um, um, it provides a ground clear, uh, clearing. So do you think that there is any way that a, a Wittgensteinian philosopher can be a fellow traveler, which I think is a nice word that you, um, you bring in, um, with those scientists? And if so, in what sense and to what extent? So um, third, I have a question about um, the shift from knowledge first approach to an knowledge first approach. So this shift is of course very crucial in the issue of gender. So um, in a conservative society, um, for example, so trans women and men will find a very emotional reaction. So sometimes 
being repelling from the society without even being lessened. So an acknowledged first approach would therefore open the possibility of lessening, tolerating, and understanding. So I think even from the um, perspective of common sense, um, I definitely agree that we should uh, advocate uh, for an acknowledged first approach. But I wish actually to know more about this acknowledged first world. So what's the role of knowledge, reasoning, theory, etc.? So those presumably are important in the knowledge first approach, placed in an acknowledged first world, in, in an acknowledged first world. So would the acknowledged first approach lead to the situation that anyone's claim about their gender is correct because they have the first person authority? Um, so would this acknowledged first approach um, maybe to liberate? So if, I mean, the um, knowledge first approach is to, um, to narrow, but would this acknowledged first approach to broad? So, because understanding um, is hard, it's difficult, and not always possible. So even when we acknowledge and learn about um, their story. So to rephrase my question in a, um, in a different um, way, so yes, we acknowledge first, but then what's next? Um, so I think that's my uh, comments and thank you again for um, your talk and I hope my comments are relevant and helpful uh, to you. Thank you. Thank you, Fan Zhao, for giving the comments. So, uh, Professor Sherman, would you like to respond to the comments? Uh, yes, very much. They, they were splendid comments. Thank you so much. There's so much to, to for me to think about and, and I'll sort of give some immediate thoughts uh, right away, but, but thank you so much. Um, the, I, I like your reflections on, on paths and in particular on uh, bringing footprints in. Um, that, uh, yes, I think that um, the, way, the way that a path comes to be is that multiple people are walking it and and as you say are putting down their footprints and I like the idea that everybody's footprints are going to be in slightly different places even as they're you know make bringing the same path into into existence um, um, and I think I mean the idea of fellow travelers sometimes it might be that other people who are in important ways very much like me and are heading in more or less or heading to the same destination or we're on the same journey um, but it needn't be that that um, fellow travelers can be those who accompany us through part of the way um, who share some of our aims but not all who are often as we set out on paths, we're really lost. I mean, as I, a number of the things that I quoted have said, we, we don't really quite know exactly where it is that we're going, that we'll only discover it as, as we forge the path. And one of the things, I mean, the first use that I made of the path imagery was in something I was writing about what, how, um, the, the lives of people who identified in particular as transsexual were lived, especially in the US, but not only, when it started out where what it was was airplane trips. That is, if you could persuade the people who control the apparatus of medical surgery and hormones and so on, that you were really transsexual, you could pass their tests, they put you in an airplane was very expensive. And the odd thing, I mean, maybe, you know, you all have noticed this very weird thing about um, real literal airplane travel is that you start out in one place, you end up in another place and you're no place in between. It's very <laughs> strange and disorienting because up there in the airplane, it's not, it's not a place. And so originally that's what it was. You'd get, t you know, put in an airplane and put to this other place where it's told you, you can live here. But then you had to pretend you were native to that place. 
So you had to rewrite your life story to always having been what you have now, as it were, become. And it was very problematic practice. But what happened was some very brave and imaginative people said, no, we're going to set out on paths. And instead of signing up for these airplane rides, they set out on paths. And one of the things that happens when people are on paths is that you end up in unexpected places, that it isn't just there's a place here and a place there, that there's places in between, as there aren't in an airplane travel. And those places in between are places that you didn't know existed before. And where it turns out you can actually live there or circle around and come back. And so paths diverge and branch off and so on. And so I think that the complexity, and I really love the idea of the individual footprints and the roles that those play, um, but the, what becomes, if, I guess I've, one of the things about footprints, I mean, sometimes they can like turn into fossils, but for the most part, footprints are ephemeral. And so it isn't just that they're individual, but they tend to be ephemeral. And one of the things about paths is, unlike roads, which as you say, appear on maps, and as I say, are done by central planning and decided on in advance and just laid out at once. Um, paths come to take on a, well, they change the face of the earth, as I put it, and they, and they tend to last, and they become well-trodden, and so on. And so I think that interplay between the idiosyncrasy of the footprint and the idea that if I'm going to get somewhere, I'm going to actually need fellow travelers and that what is involved is this changing the face of your So it's a wonderful enrichment of the imagery, and thank you very much for that. Um, the, the role of philosophers in theoretical domain, in particular, you, the example of um, the relationship of philosophers, especially philosophers of mind, philosophers of psychology, to, to neuroscience, um, is I think that that's one area in which philosophy has been overly captured by a kind of worship of science, a kind of scientistic impulse, which is one of the things that Wittgenstein is very concerned to argue against, the idea that all the real questions are to be answered by the sciences and that philosophy ought to you know, do this handmaiden clearing up kind of thing, but basically follow where the science leads. And the idea that these questions are ultimately scientific questions, I think is part of the problem. And my earlier work, and it's sort of continued to be something that I'm interested in, was in the philosophy of mind. Um, I was in arguing for the idea that um, mental states, events, but whatever, mental stuff, um, emotions, desires, intentions, beliefs, all of that are socially constructed. And the neuroscience is clearly important. I mean, I wouldn't do any of those things if my brain weren't doing a lot of stuff. But then again, I wouldn't be breathing if my brain weren't doing a lot of stuff. Um, but there's no way, I mean, so I've, I wrote things like the project was against physicalism, that there's no way in the world, it's just, it's an impossible research project to think that beliefs, intentions, emotions, desires could be brain states. And they couldn't be brain states, not because they're, you know, it's not a matter of dualism. They couldn't be because they're socially constructed. They're patterns that are socially salient. They're ways that we have of making sense of what's going on. And we couldn't do it without all of the underlying neuroscience. But the understanding, the explanation, even the thinking in terms of causality of what goes on in our mental lives is thoroughgoingly social. So the basic idea is if you abstract from the social, the mental disaggregates. Um, it's a complex set of arguments, but basically the idea is that if you want to understand us as emotional, cognizing, intelligible, 
thinking, feeling, intending beings. You have to understand us as socially meaningful. And you have to understand what's going on in us <coughs> in terms of social intelligibility. And neuroscience is not going to get us that. So the, what's the important work of philosophically understanding ourselves as you know, psychological beings is occluded, is, it's, it's abandoned by allowing oneself to be captured by the science. Um, now, the, this idea that we are dependent on social intelligibility obviously gets at the kind of problem I'm talking about in the current paper, that is those for whom social intelligibility doesn't help us understand ourselves. It, it's disastrous for our ability to understand ourselves. And so that becomes the importance of creating new paths, of discovering and building new worlds of sense so that we don't just have our own individual footprints but we have paths that if, if meaning is social and meaning requires paths and paths require footprints, but footprints alone can't do it. So we're dependent on the social and that brings up the poignancy of a dependency on that, which is killing us. And how do we, how do we deal with that? Um, so the third point of the shift from knowledge to acknowledgement, sort of what happens next and can somebody, if we grant a certain kind of first person authority, um, it's defeasible and it is on Betcher's terms. But that, um, and this is something a number of philosophers, Nancy Bauer very much, but a number of them are, are is, is, and Bet Betcher herself. The question is, what are we doing? So when we want to save somebody, you've got it wrong about your own gender identity. Who are we to be saying that? What's our relationship to this person? Um, you know, how do you come on, you know, who, who, what's this conversation like? What's this relationship like? So one of the reasons for building worlds, communities and worlds of trust is so that one can be in a position to be a trusted interlocutor, to help somebody deal with confusion to raise the possibility that there might be another way of going on, that maybe they're trapped in a particular story because it's the only one that's socially available to them. I mean, so for example, the early transsexual story, which was somehow this is, it's built into you and it's somehow it's gotta be real and the scientists are gonna determine it and then they're going to fix it, cure your gender dysphoria and so on, sort of locked a lot of people into a very rigid story. In fact, Betcher has an article called Trapped in the Wrong Theory. And so it required fellow travelers to say, let's loosen this up. Let's pay attention to the paths. Let's see that there are other ways of going on, that this isn't the only alternative story, that it isn't that there are just men or just women, and you happen to have been, as it was put, born in the wrong body. So a lot of people, some of them were just telling the born in the wrong body story because that was gonna get them the medical care they wanted, and they knew they were telling them made up cockamamie weird story. But some of them really believed it because it was all, it was, the, it was the only set of conceptual resources that were available to help them make the changes they wanted to make. And so it took loving, to use a term from the philosopher Marilyn Fry, loving attention, the creation of alternative worlds of sense. Uh, it took acknowledgement. It took respectful engagement in order to be in the position to help someone see that there are other possibilities than the ones they seem to be locked into. Okay, I'll stop there. But thank you very much. Those were really wonderful questions and, and challenges. Well, thank you very much um, for, your, for your comment. Thank you. Okay, so I guess now we can start the general discussion because we can't, um, we have plenty of time. Maybe we can just, um, that participants who want to ask